Hi, everyone. I'm Carol Becker, Dean of Columbia University School of the Arts. And it is my pleasure to introduce this program, which is a collaboration between the Wallach Art Gallery, the Columbia Alumni Association, and Columbia at Home. It will be an opportunity for all of you to take a virtual tour of the current exhibition, Uptown Triennial, which is a fantastically interesting show that's now featured at the Wallach Art Gallery. So the School of the Arts is very proud to work closely with the Wallach Art Gallery. They have been our partners in many incredible art events hosted in our Lenfest Center for the Arts, which is named for Jerry and Marguerite Lenfest. And we are so fortunate to cohabitate with them in a gorgeous building designed by Renzo Piano and one of the first that opened the new Manhattanville campus. The Wallach really is an exciting venue. It houses our visual arts first year and thesis exhibitions and so many other shows during the year. The gallery moved to the Lenfest Center in 2017. And in these past few years, it has truly increased its visibility in the university while also creating a very strong presence in its new Harlem location. The gallery is open to Columbia students, faculty and staff, as well as to the general public. It has featured the work of global artists as well as New York artists. And it has worked closely with local organizations in this famous cultural context of Harlem to develop original and historic shows such as Posey Modernity, which was an incredible success and 23,000 people came through to see that show. At today's event, Betty Sue Hertz will be joined by one of the artists who is in the triennial, Javier Simmons, whose work is presented in this exhibition. And they will engage in a dialogue about the show and about her work. And at the end of the tour, you, the audience, will have an opportunity to ask questions, both of Betty Sue and also of the artist. So I want to offer for, right now for to you a very brief introduction of Betty Sue Hertz, who is the director and chief curator of the Wallach Art Gallery since 2019. Betty Sue is a curator and a scholar. Her practice focuses on the intersection between critical visual culture, transnational exchange, and socially relevant issues, creating fluidity between these sectors, driving new scholarship, and connecting with local audiences. She worked for years at the Bronx Council of the Arts and as director of Longwood Arts Project before relocating to California, where she spent the last two decades in various roles, including director of visual arts at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts and curator of contemporary art at the San Diego Museum of Art. And she was also curator in residence at the Howe Art Museum in Shanghai in 2018 and also a public arts consultant with TLS Landscape Architecture for major projects in Shuzhou and Shenzhen since 2016. She's curated many groundbreaking exhibitions with artists such as Bill T. Jones, Renee Green, Mark Bedford, Rikrit Tirvanika, and so forth. And in addition to her career as a curator and scholar, she's also an educator, which makes her of course perfect for us uh, to have at Columbia. She has taught social art history and theory at Stanford University, the San Francisco Art Institute, and the University of California, Berkeley. And we're really thrilled and very fortunate that she wanted to come back to New York and that she wanted to work with us at the Lenfest Center for the Arts as director and chief curator of the Wallach Art Gallery. So now I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Betty Sue Hertz, who's gonna run the rest of the program. Thank you. Hello. Thank you so much, Carol, for your very warm and generous introduction, but even more your willingness to work so closely with us and to support the Wallach in more ways than I can count. As we all know, having collaborative colleagues is, is is the most important way for us to really be successful in what we do. And so I really thank you so much and um, wanna join you in, in saying it's a 
amazing to be here um, in this space, this beautiful 4,000 square foot exhibition space. And um, <clears throat> it has been a challenge, truthfully, to be running an exhibition space since the trans, uh, since, since March, we've been working all remotely for the most part, but we do come together once in a while for programs like this in the gallery. So what is the exhibition that we're gonna talk about today? I wanna to introduce Uptown Triennial 2020. This is the sec second iteration of an exhibition that will take place every three years. The function of a triennial is for us to basically get a snapshot of what people are, what artists, what are artists doing? What are they thinking about? What are they making? And why are they making these things? But this year we had a special opportunity to converge this triennial idea, which is really this notion of uptown originally was thinking, these are artists that live or work above 99th Street. But there was something even more important this time, which is that 2020 is also the centennial anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. So here we are in Harlem and we have an opportunity to bridge a hundred years from the 19, 1920s and 30s to 2020. And to see what is that legacy, to understand that legacy by looking at the contemporary work of the many artists that both live and work in this um, neighborhood and elsewhere, and to start to reevaluate what the value of the Harlem Renaissance is for our contemporary moment. But before I get into all the tour, I would like to introduce you to Javiera Simmons, who, as Carol mentioned, is one of the featured artists. Um, Simmons's body of work spans photography, performance, video, sound, sculpture, and installation. She received her BFA from Bard College in 2004 after spending two years on a walking pilgrimage retracing, retracing the transatlantic slave trade with Buddhist monks. Javier completed the Whitney Museum's independent study program in studio art in 2005, while simultaneously completing a two-year actor training conservatory with the Maggie Flanagan Studio. Her exhibitions and performances have been reviewed extensively in the United States and internationally. She was a visiting lecturer and the inaugural 2019 Solomon Fellow at Harvard University and has been awarded the Charles Flint Kellogg Award in Arts and Letters from Bard College. This fall and winter 2021, in addition to Uptown, Simmons will have works on view at Socrates Sculpture Park, which is in Queens, New York, Times Square, the Moody Gallery at Rice University, and the Liverpool Biennial in England, among many other exhibitions. So I just wanted to introduce you to her before she comes on screen. So what do we have here? This is the opening shot of the exhibition with the title wall. Let's walk into the gallery and look at the very, very first walk. What, very, very first um, work. What we're going to do is focus on just a few of the works in the gallery, but you'll get to see the installation, um, the overall installation as well. It was very important for us to begin the exhibition with a work that would set the tone and frame chronologically the Harlem Renaissance itself. This is a work by the amazing artist Woodfield Lavelle from 2008 called Autour du Monde. Why is this work so relevant for us? We see here three panels 
with men in World War I uh, uniforms, and then a series of globes. So the artist has told us that his grandfather had wanted to serve in the army for World War I, because as an African-American man, it was one of the few ways that one could see the world. One could get out of the local conditions of a hundred years ago and to explore the world in an American uniform. Unfortunately, Whitfield's father was rejected for being too short. And we, that's a whole you know, story in itself because some of his friends were rejected for being too tall. But what this story tells us is that these narratives are meaningful for us at this present time because for many of these artists, they can also tell us other stories about their grandparents and what they like, their life was like 100 years ago or 80 years ago. So we can continue, we can see this installation. So what happened is, why this is important is that when the soldiers came back from the war, there was a, a battalion of African-American men, the 349th Battalion, and there was a parade for them in Harlem. This set off this new sense of confidence and of truly being an American that set the stage for the artists and intellectuals that would then start to shape the Harlem Renaissance. And we can continue. So here's a shot of the installation and we're going to move in and look more closely at one of the six objects from the period of the Harlem Renaissance that form the touchstones for clusters of contemporary artworks that resonate with these older works. So I'm showing here a book, the first edition of a book that was organized by Elaine Locke called The New Negro an interpretation. The history of this particular book is also so exciting for us. The book which we found in the Union Theological Seminary's library has been in the collection of Columbia since 1927. In fact, in the back, you remember those old stamps in the library that they would stamp when, when you took the book out and you got a little, they took the little slip and put it in a box. Those stamps are still there, telling the history of this book. It's still in circulation. In fact, my colleague Lewis, who you meet later, actually just went to the, went to the library and, and took it out with his ID card. Yet it is the first edition of this book and the only edition that includes these color plates, like the one you see here, of original drawings by an artist named Winhold Rees. Now, Reese was Aaron Douglas's teacher. Reese was a German emigre. And he trained Aaron Douglas, one of the most renowned of the Harlem Renaissance artists. And that is how he came to participate in this book. But the illustration that you see on the right, the African design, that is by Aaron Douglas. But Elaine Locke went to Africa in 1923. And he was searching for a new way to construct the American African American identity, the black identity, because he knew that there must be another way of thinking about blackness. And it is there that he was able to start to articulate it is through there and through his studies in, in Europe. He was a Rhodes Scholar. So he was cosmopolitan. He was reaching out beyond sort of the confines of the United States to, to start to explore how do we construct new, new ways of framing and thinking about ourselves as Black Americans. 
He invited in, into his book many important writers from the period, like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, and many, many others. So you can see that this object is really rich and it provides us with many ideas to think about um, as artists and also as people who love art. And we can start to see other aspects of the Harlem Renaissance that emerge in the work of contemporary artists, like the artist Derek Adams. You can see this is an installation and this work here on the right now is from 2020, it's called Where It's At. It's wallpaper and vinyl. The wallpaper are clips from the green book. I'm sure most of you know about the green book, at least from the award-winning award film <laughs> by that name from 2018. But the, re the green book is, is, is a complex, I mean, tells a complex story um, of, it started, it was, it was published initially, the first edition was published in 1936. So it, corresponds with the Great Migration, which historically is considered from 1916 to 1970. And it's at a time when, of course, there were many color lines for Black Americans who wanted to travel. Some of those Americans were traveling because they were part of the Great, great Migration. They were moving from the South to the North. And later, after World War II, the Green Book became more of a guide for, for tourism. Like, we want to see other parts of the US, but we want to be safe. And we want to be among people who will protect us from white supremacism and other kinds of aggressions. So we can see here, there are a lot of clips in, in this wallpaper of, of this New York area, New York City, upstate New York, sort of this region, which make it an absolutely fascinating um, archive of, of people and places that we, places that we still love to go to today, like um, various parks in New York, for example. And then he overlaid it with um, neons, um, service, motel, hair, et cetera, that are, you know, represent the, the, the kinds of experiences or the needs of the people who were traveling. I'd like to just say before I hand this over to Xaviera that this work and her work have some interesting formal uh, aspects that, are, uh, that they share. Uh, they share an interest in the Great Migration and the movement of Black people in the United States. They share the, the scale, this kind of mural scale, a sense of the grid. And I think very importantly, these are contemporary artists that take their research seriously. They work very, very hard to really understand what that past was about and how they could represent the present by integrating it with the past. So with that, I'd like to move us through to the next slide and hand over the mic to Xaviera Simmons, and she can talk directly to you about her work. Well, thank you all. It's nice to see everyone. And thank you, Betty Sue, for that uh, introduction. and. It's um, nice to be here. So um, I'm just, I wanted to um, briefly talk about um, a little bit about my personal biography. And that is that I did, which, which Betty Sue mentioned, I did do a walking pilgrimage, retracing parts of the transatlantic slave trade on this, this land. So for me, um, the United States, its borders, the land, um, something that I think about pretty often because I've spent a lot of time understanding 
you know, the what has happened on this land um, historically and then contemporarily. And I think that I work from that lens of, of thinking about how can I, uh, for lack of a better word, how can I like tighten my lenses and, and understand what I'm seeing now um, by sometimes looking at the present directly and sometimes looking at the past. Um, so for this body of work, uh, this is actually an excerpt from a larger piece called The Whole United States is Southern. Um, and it was produced in 2019 um, for an exhibition at SF MoMA originally. And we excerpted um, the parts of the paintings. Um, the, the work is, is heavily in, heavily indebted to um, Jacob Lawrence's migration series, which half of which is at the Phillips collection and half of which is at the Museum of Modern Art. And it's 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 work that I actually grew up seeing being from New York. And so what really excited me um, about these about Lawrence's practice in general, obviously, is his his beautiful renderings of the figure. And, but I really, really also love his color palette and his, um, his and his wife's uh, language around the, the kind of the, the text that sits besides, beside the images um, of the migration series of which, I, you know, until I started doing research for this project, I didn't really pay attention to the text as much. Um, I really was so captivated by his rendering and his his paintings. Um, but when I started to pay attention to the text, I was like, wow, like he's really going deep into um, why the migrants left. You know, there's 60 panels in the migration series. And so it's, you know, each one is accompanied by a kind of a narrative, a story about explaining you know what's inside of the painting and i really wanted to contend with the text and then i wanted to have a conversation with the text um that he crafted for his for the figurative works so i um you know took aspects of i took his whole entire text uh as the foundation for this work and kind of you know used it as a way to meditate on the history and meditate on the paintings and meditate on um, the, the color palette. But then I also added um, contemporary text to the work and language that I embodied because, you know, I, as I've said, um, you know, Jacob Lawrence had, you know, firsthand knowledge close family members who had directly fled the South through due primarily to where we, where we can see here, white mobs burn black towns and lynch black people, right? Like he was very close to that. Now my lifetime, I understand what has happened from his work and his knowledge, but also how the data and statistics and information that we have now to understand like even the broader scope of why, you know, black folks in particular were fleeing, literally fleeing the South. I mean, and, it, and it's all obviously tied to um, government policies supported the bondage and sale of people of African descent for the benefit of white people. White mobs burn black towns and lynch black people. I mean, that is, that is, it's a, it's a violence that I don't want to necessarily replay, um, but it is a violence that helps me understand how we are living today. And so I think that that's, that's my way into um, thinking about Lawrence's work and thinking about my relationship to it and also understanding both personal family history as my family were sharecroppers in the South. Um, and then also understanding, you know, certain things like I have the larger um, text here beside this that you guys are looking at. So, I'm, you know, one aspect that I added that is not part of Lawrence's language is, uh, I'll, I'll read it from the beginning. The history of racism and exclusion in the United States is the history of whiteness. California once tried to ban free black people. The great migration was about racial terror. So I, I tried to add kind of 
the language that I would work with alongside Lawrence's language to create this kind of new uh, conversation around the Great Migration and also American history, really. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Am I? Oh, I'm not getting. Hmm? Oh, I am? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I was confused there for a minute. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, actually, let's go back a couple of slides, if it's possible. Thank you. There we go. So um, thank you so much, Javier. And I'm so pleased we'll have time uh, in a few minutes to talk about some of the things that you mentioned and also to talk a little to, with each other more broadly um, about this exhibition and being a contemporary artist today and, and maybe even more broadly than that. The, but I want to end um, the tour with one additional work. In between these works, you're getting to see the installation shots, which I think always are a hard to read an exhibition through them. But um, we're now in, in a completely different uh, area of the gallery. And it's actually the area where I'm sitting. So we can um, move now closer to the Derek Bajor painting Alternation One from 2020. And from this vantage point, this looks like a painting. Um, but when we get closer, we'll, we'll, we'll see that it's, it's way more complex than that in terms of the way it's made. But let's just talk a little bit more about the imagery. Um, we see here exaggerated movements of um, majorettes and this is an artist who has been celebrating totems of black culture and has made paintings of, of uh, sports figures and entertainment, but usually in ensembles, or at least many of them are in these ensembles of people who are together, who are doing something meaningful, not only in terms of the act, but also that there's a sort of social connection. But he's developed this language that is combines the way that the painting is make, made with what is represented on the in, in the painting. I'm calling it a painting. It's it is a painting, but it's also a collage. It's made up of layers and layers and layers of small pieces of paper, sometimes seven different layers, um, one on top of the other. So the materials are acrylic, charcoal, oil pastel, and foil on newsprint mounted on canvas. But these layers that you start to see now as we zoom in, sometimes we see just pieces of them. It's like those posters in the street where the underneath people peel off the layers or even sometimes used to see it in the subway layers and layers and layers of information, you can't really see what was underneath entirely, but you get a glimpse of it. And that is one way that we can think about history, right? This layering of history, that history that is visible or partially visible, and those histories that are actually completely erased and fumbled over. We also see this kind of technique in, in an informal graffiti, right? Where one graffiti writer writes, someone else writes over it. Whose image is at the end of this process? What is the image at the end of the process? In, in a variety of different ways that we see this kind of layering, um, I think tells the story of the way that people engage with each, each other over time with visual images. But in this artist's work, we can see both the scumbling of the mark making, the rip and tear. This is not neat 
This is not a neat history. This is not a neat way of making collage, but it is one that adds layer upon layer and that the closer you get, the more you see that the detail is as much a part of what this painting is about as the big bold image of the major majorettes, I guess majorettes. Anyway, so I um, thank you so much for joining us for the tour. And here we have a couple of other installation shots. And I don't know if um, Xaviera would like to talk a little bit about her experience of being an artist and participating in the exhibition and anything that you might want to say about the exhibition itself. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, funny enough, I was a majorette. <laughs> so um, um, when I was, uh, gosh, like 12, 13, 14. So I, I just realized that, I just remembered that as I'm looking at that. I used to march in parades in um, New York City. So I, I feel really uh, some kinship to that that image because I understand it. Um, but I, you know, it's, you know, showing uptown, showing in Harlem, I mean, Harlem is a part of my life. I don't live in Harlem anymore, but I did when I was younger. And um, it's definitely, you know, a critical part of my life because my family has lived there. Um, I have historical roots to the black churches there. Um, the black uh, funeral homes there. Like uh, I have a deep connection to Harlem. So it's always really amazing to show um, uptown. And I was actually really looking forward to the community. Um, you know, I mean, you guys are across the street from like a massive housing complex, right? So it's like, I, I, I dream of a, I dream of a, an America, of a United States, where A, we have those housing projects actually um, be sustainable, clean, clear, beautiful homes for people to live in. But I also dream of an America where the people inside of those housing projects and the students inside of Columbia and the, 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 the art galleries and all of that can kind of cross section come together there. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I dream of a, of a, of a, of a, a, a way that the landscape can become a really fruitful reality for everyone. So I was actually really excited when this exhibition was proposed to me by you because I kind of had that envision in my head, you know, that that was going to happen somehow. So it's interesting that, um, not interesting, I don't know if that's the word, but COVID, here we come, you know, and, and now, you know, we're limited in who can see the exhibition. And I think it's such a critical exhibition for, for folks, you know, the people who are across the street from you are descendants primarily of a lot of the people we're talking about. So it'd be so interesting to have that kind of cross-pollination conversation. Um, and maybe there's some way to kind of instigate that kind of programming if it doesn't already happen um, so that you know, and that that was really what excited me the most. And of course, I always love showing with my contemporaries. These are some of my favorite artists. I think about their work all the time. I'm 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 like, oh, I wish I had made that, or you know what I mean. I want to see this. Um, so yeah, it's it's beautiful. Um, COVID has really changed our world, though. So we have to always contend with that when we talk about 2020. And 21. Yes, absolutely. Totally. Yeah. The way that most people are seeing this exhibition, which is yeah. a virtual tour, right? Thank you so much for those words. What I'd like to do now is invite my colleague, Philip Long, the gallery's associate director of external affairs, to join us. And he will be moderating the question and answer component of this event. Good evening, everyone. So good to see you, Xavier and Betty Sue. Always good to see you. You're in the gallery. I'm jealous. 
<laughs> Although it looks like I'm here, so it's good. It does. <laughs> and so I, I want to start with one question, and we have a number in the queue, but, you know, Xavier and I had a chance to chat just a bit earlier today, and, and one of the things that I told her, Betty Sue, is that as we started planning this exhibition over a year ago, uh, there was an immediate response that there was a work that had to be in the show that you had seen at Soft Power um, in 2019, and it was the whole United States is Southern. Can you just talk about why immediately that was in your 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 spirit that we really needed to have this as a as a piece to the show? Inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, in thinking about how we put the show together, and I, I must say, I have to thank Lewis because it was really, in many ways, a team effort with, with, with you and with, with so many of the other people on our staff here. You know, I'd seen, I'd seen the entire work in an exhibition that was completely different. Um, yet it spoke to everything that I wanted us to do in this show, which was to bridge that past with the present, but to speak also about what is going on in our world right now. I love that there was this text that I couldn't quite understand where it was coming from. So that, and I also thought about Jacob Lawrence immediately when I saw the panels of color, because those panels of color are just taken directly from these modernist works. So how do we think about modernist art and then translate some of those values that we still feel are important to the contemporary art forms that we have now, this way that the text and the color, color panels work together is very, very contemporary. Um, so I was really pleased when you said that you would be willing to show the work, even though we couldn't present the entire piece. And I was coming from San Francisco, so I'd seen Soft Power there, um, and I like the way it worked there in an exhibition of international artists, but I really wanted to see how it would work here in Harlem. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. It changes. I mean, that's what's really amazing about group exhibitions. The same work of art will, will while it's ontologically sort of autonomous, it also, will be read and experienced differently in different exhibitions. And that's one of the things I like about curating group shows. And, and so Betty Sue mentioned that, you know, the, just the size of our gallery could not accommodate the full piece. And, and so she's really implicitly speaking to just the monumental scale of this work. Uh, Xavier, can you speak to, you know, the scale of this work and, Obviously, you've spoken to the con content of it, but talk about the imprint and the impression of such a, a large scale piece. And then also how that relates to how that has been a thread in other works in your practice. I love those questions. Um, I, it's interesting, you know, as I'm maturing as an artist, right? Like I, I you know, you want more space because, because there's more to say because you're digesting so much information and also you have, you know, an archive of information to work with. And for me, you know, art making, there's two ways that I look at art making. I'm a, I really do feel akin to laboring, like as in a doctor or a, uh, a, uh, Oh, uh, any kind of arts worker, I feel very much akin to that. So I, I feel um, I like having my hand on everything. I like um, painting. I hand paint everything. I did it. You know what I mean? I do it myself. I, 
um, do the research, then do the painting and the, the, the painting after and again and again and again. Um, and then I, I, I work to install these works. And so for me, it's really exciting to see that scale happening at, from my body as a woman, as an arts worker, as a laborer, um, and also as a kind of expression of the importance of the language inside of Lawrence's work in particular, like giving the language, just the sheer language space to breathe, even though the language is overwhelming. There's something to, we don't pay, in with the Great Migration, we know it, we all know those images so well, but we don't focus enough on the language. And I feel so, I, I was so excited when I produced it at um, SFMOMA and now here at Columbia because you have to focus on the language and what the language is saying and what it is asking of us even now. And, and I think um, something that Betty Sue pointed out and something that I think that's really important, you know, the Harlem Renaissance, this is not a long period of time. This is not long ago, right? Like all of these things that have happened, all of the things that, you know, the ramifications of what happened during the Harlem Renaissance, what people were expressing, and then after, until now, until your contemporary artist, we understand that history, a century, we are living the ramifications of what happened a century ago. So I'm really excited to have that much space to kind of question, examine, confront, think about, explore, fall in love with the whole history that I can call from Lawrence's work and put it inside of my own work. Um, and, and, and lastly, for me, this is, this is like, um, I have binoculars here, so I'm gonna do it as an example. You know, this work is like binoculars, right? It's like a, it's like a film that's coming over your eyes and making you understand and think about not only what you see in the past, but what you're looking at in the present. And it starts off with the history of racism in America is the history of whiteness. And you can't escape that as you keep reading the rest of the text. So the I'm very, I love that Betty Sue put this in this, in this, in this this gallery. I love it, you know, in this time. Who knew? We didn't know this was all coming, what we're living through. We didn't know. And here we are. And there's spaces, which is what an institution is, a, is, is one of the thing, tasks that institutions and universities are supposed to do, which is give people time to reflect and think about the historical and the contemporary. And I feel like this exhibition does that in this particular landscape, which is pretty remarkable. And she didn't know this was gonna happen. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. Oh, thank, thank you for that. You know, I wanted to just provide some context for everyone listening, because while Zaveria has, has been very generous with her time to be with her today, she is a very busy person. And because our audience is, is drawn from really all over the world, um, I wanted just to make sure that folks understood that she currently has act, other active projects in New York, uh, in Miami. Uh, she'll have something coming up in Liverpool, and she'll also have something in France uh, in, um, 2021. And so I just wanted to just establish that because, uh, she's incredible. Her work is incredibly accessible in that it is being shown around the world. Uh, but I want to come back to something that I, I, I heard you say in one of your talks, and I think it relates to two of the works that we have kind of focused on here. And that is the, um, work by Derek Adams, where it's at. And then obviously your work, uh, the whole United States is Southern. And that is, I heard you say um, in one of your talks that you love driving through the US. And <laughs> as we know that there was a lot of romance um, associated with the great migration and also with um, the green book of sorts. And, and we know that those origins are, are somewhat complicated in terms of the necessity uh, for them, but yet and still, uh, you hold out that you love driving through the U.S., which 
you know, is a is I thought was very beautiful actually as you talk about why, and I want you to share that. Mm, that's interesting. Well, truth be told, I love driving through the U.S. Means I love being in the passenger seat because my <laughs> partner he actually drives me so many places. So I have to. I'm gonna be. He probably hears me in the, you know, I want to show him that love because he really, you know, it's epic, amazing person. So I get to go, I get to just be on my, you know, I have my phone, my binoculars, my cameras, everything. But that being said, um, I do love, you know, I've walked the country, right? A parts of it, the Eastern seaboard. Um, I recognize my, I've traveled through Europe, I've, or Europe, I've traveled through Africa, I've traveled through different parts of Asia, Australia, this one that I've been, I've lived in Europe. Um, but what I recognize is that I, I'm American. Like I would not exist had the, I, in, in this form, had the United States not formed itself the way it did down to the fact that it has not um, resolved itself since the Civil War, you know, and before um, it has not resolved uh, its relationship to both indigenous peoples, of course, and then those people, those mixed race people who are descendants of slavery. And that means also that the white population majority hasn't resolved itself in terms of what it is we're doing here together with, you know, we're right now stuck the continental US, right? Like we're, we're here, the edges are here, they're all here, we can't really leave, right? And so I think this is such an opportune time to understand the place that you are in. And I think that I'm all, I have for many, many years worked to try to understand the place that I am in, whether it be in Harlem, you know, when I was younger, whether it be understanding myself as an American when I've traveled abroad and realizing that I wouldn't exist because of it or understanding, you know, when I was in San Francisco and in LA, how there are uh, 200,000 homeless <laughs> black people primarily um, lining the streets. I need, I need to understand what I'm looking at, right? Like I'm some, I got my binoculars, right? Like I need to understand what I'm looking at and the way you understand what you're looking at and why it looks the way it does, especially in the, the this country where we're all together um, is to travel it, to see it, to see how the cities affect the rural areas, affect the, the, you know, the countrysides, affect the seashores, affect the coasts and the middle. I mean, you have to, it, it, it behooves us to understand where we are now, finally. Like with this much time on our hands, it behooves us to say, okay, what is this place? I live in Chicago. Why does Chicago look the way it does? Why does New York look the way it does? Why does San Francisco, one of the wealthiest uh, cities in the country, have a massive homeless population like what we have to reconcile that but the only way to do that and I don't want to say empathetically I just say factually looking at the statistics that the government and the cities and the universities put out is to look at what it is we're looking at and so that's why I love driving or being the passenger and directing a driver who's my partner is because I want to understand what I'm looking at when I see it. And, and, and before we jump into the, there are a few other questions, but you mentioned earlier about hand, hand, handwritten signs that you see when you're driving yeah. and, and you have, that's an important part of your practice that you talked about. So just a yeah. word about handwriting. Um, huh? Uh, you know, I started really looking at, you know, just having walked and driving around and being in the South and being upstate and being in, you know, every, all cultures handwrite signs. There's always this, 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 you know, 
peaches or um, a car for sale or apartment. And I, and I, and I've always been in love with that. I've always, I've always been attracted to this, like, kind of like almost like free gallery space on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and I always want those signs. Like when I see the strawberry sign, I'm like, Oh, it's rendered so good. Like, give it to me. Um, but I also love, obviously I love, um, people like Robert Rauschenberg's work or um, Margaret Kilgallen. Is that how you say her name? I mean, these are, these are like beautiful art. I mean, any, all, all of these artists who work with signage and, and the hand and where you can see it and it's totally there's like, you know, that's their work. Um, I think that uh, the same can be said for ordinary people who are not intentionally thinking about it as an art form, but thinking of it as a practical way to exchange goods and commerce. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, I, I wanted to work in that tradition. And, you know, the longer that I've worked with my own hand and hand painting and hand sign, and, you know, it's all just become more poetic because the hand and the head and the breath all start to work together. And I'm not selling things per se, or directing people to purchase something, but I'm directing them to pause and have a reflective moment about something or creating a landscape. So that's kind of like my love for it. And it's, it's never ending this right. body of work. That's awesome. Well, well, thank you. Thank uh, you. There, there are a number of questions that I wanted to address that were, that came in from our audience. Uh, the first is, uh, can you let me know the name of the artist who painted the majorettes and speak about it some more? Uh, so Betty Sue, uh, there was a question yeah. about, uh, okay. <laughs> about alternation. Louis, do you want to add a voice to this? What I was going to add to it is that well, the artist... But I'd like to you know, you, you're very familiar with Derek Forgeur's work. Absolutely. You've been... Um, looking at it for some time and I've actually wanted to maybe throw it to you. Sure, sure, sure. And, and so, so first why, of all, why, why you're drawn to this work. Yeah, I, I am drawn to Derek's work because he has a way of capturing elements of, of culture, black culture uh, in a way that uh, is rhythmic that is uh, aesthetically kind of like captivating uh, because of his process of, of, of texture and using layers. And he starts with the Financial Times newsprint as a, as, a, as a key material for his work. And so what you see is those layers in many cases are, are actual newsprint. Uh, and it's the pink newsprint of the Financial Times, which has a, 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 an entire history related to it. Uh, and so um, I am drawn to the work because of, of the almost universal, universality of the, the imagery from black culture perspective and the time um, periods that it covers that could look like it was 30, 50 years ago or yesterday. And so um, for me in particular, alternation with the actual drum majors uh, resonates with me as a historically black college alum, uh, where the marching bands are such an important, um, uh, interesting narrative on the culture. And it actually comes out of, believe it or not, out of the, um, the James Urban um, 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 heritage of the bands that supported the troops in the parades uh, that were returning uh, with the 369th um, regiment um, in 1919, 19, 1920, uh, that you spoke about earlier. And so, and for anyone that's interested, and for our person that's interested, for the um, listener that's interested, uh, Derek has a show that's also uh, available at Petzl Gallery right now that closes on the 19th. And so, there uh, he has uh, a number of other works that are in the same vein that I encourage you if you're interested in this work that you yeah, go see. Was, and there's a puppet show that's related to it as well. In the New York Times. And so if you want to know more about his work, you can also go to that recent feature. I think it was within the last couple of weeks, actually. Yes, 
Yes, it was. It's uh, if you just Google Google him in the New York Times, you'll come up. Uh, there's another question here. Three years ago, this gallery had an exhibit on several public housing projects built in the city, including ones nearby across the street from Columbia. I'm unsure how many people from the public housing saw this historical art exhibit. I'm glad you mentioned your interest in all people, including those who live near the ivory tower. How can Columbia University connect with the people living in the trenches, the everyday people who are in the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic and society every day? The exhibition that they're speaking of is the Frank Lloyd Wright exhibition that looked at the collection of materials that are shared between MoMA and Columbia University, coupled with um, the housing, many of the housing developments and housing, public housing um, projects that were um, created and built around the same time as Frank Lloyd Wright was building his kind of ideal America. And, and that exhibition was looking at the, the, the counter narrative between this ideal kind of suburban America with this um, very important um, public um, um, housing um, uh, approach, particularly in the cities in New York City and Harlem in particular, at a time when tenements had been the norm and they were trying to upgrade housing for residents. I just want to add that we have been very active, the uh, yeah. actively programming, um, doing public programs around this exhibition. We just held a town hall last Friday where we invited uh, members uh, from the Harlem community to talk about how they've been impacted by the pandemic and their ideas about the future of their practice, of their business, of their uh, organization. Um, in June, we also did a program that mm -hmm was really looking at uh, how people were feeling in June about the two pandemics, uh, the anti-racist movement, uh, the protests after the killing of George Floyd, as well as COVID-19. And that was a 12 hour program where we invited 12 co-conveners each to lead one of the hours. Um, we did two programs with Bob O'Mealy, who is a fantastic professor here at Columbia, on uh, two men from the Harlem Renaissance who um, really speak to, so, so we do lots of different programming, really connecting with the audience. We also do education programs on a regular basis and work with youth organizations. Uh, we're really running out of time and I yes. would like to... Um, There's one other question, Betty Sue, I think you, you, I wanted you to, and that is about access. There was concern about the public not being able to see the exhibition. So. Yeah, okay. Um, so we would love to have the public come to see the exhibition, but there is a, a rule um, here at Columbia that only people who are at Columbia who have gone through certain COVID-19 protocols are able to enter any of the buildings. So unfortunately, we have not yet been able to open the gallery to the general public. We are extending the show till February 28th. And if that policy shifts, we will immediately let everyone know that um, they can come to see the show in person. We are deeply disappointed. We originally were opening this show in June and we moved it to September. And um, we keep hoping that we'll be able to. We extend, and we extended it because of that purpose. Yeah. And there is a 3D virtual tour. Obviously it's not like being there, but if you go to our website, uh, wallet.columbia.edu, there is both a 3D virtual to tour where you literally can walk through this space and get rich depth, in-depth information about each work. And then there's also a virtual exhibition, which also lays out all of the works on our space. And we have an archive of all of our public programming there. So um, we have been able to extend the reach of many, much of our programming as well as the exhibitions in the not so perfect circumstances. Yeah, so please jump on the website. Um, we, we, we're not only archiving these programs, but we, we have the videotapes of them. Yeah. So um, before we conclude, I want to thank Javier for joining thank us you tonight. So much. 
Thank you awesome. so much, Lewis, thank for you. leading this section of the event. I would also like to thank all of you who've joined us for this tour. I hope you will take this virtual stroll through the rest of the exhibition, as Lewis just mentioned. And I want to invite you to sign up for our newsletter so that you can keep up with our programming and know exactly when we'll be open again. The Columbia at Home series will take a break through the end of the year. It will return on January 6th at 6 p.m. with a program on home exercise and the world of virtual fitness. Featuring college and business school alum, Austin Cohen and general studies alum, Justin Turetsky of Flexit Fitness. You can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Thank you all again for joining us. I hope you have a wonderful and safe holiday season. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.